very much for that. Prateek Parekh, equity strategist at Nuvama Group, is now joining in on the show now. Uh, Prateek, uh, morning. Thank you very much for joining in. I think you all came out with a note just on 1st of August, and it couldn't have been timed better because you're talking about how India's valuations are at the highest that we've seen. Whether you look at market cap to GDP at 150%, this was the previous peak was in 2007 uh, when the big fall in the Indian markets, uh, you know, we saw that big fall in the Indian markets. And you've also highlighted the risk of extreme drawdowns when we come to such extreme valuations. What's the market call? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ima, for having me over. It's always a pleasure being on the show. Uh, so I think from a market standpoint, you know, I think clearly things have gone a bit on the higher side. Uh, whether you look at valuations on any metric, whether it's absolute market cap to GDP, whether you look at the breadth of the valuations, where median trailing P of a BSE 500 company is at 45x, uh, which is almost 2x of 2007, or whether you look at relative to EM, where India is the only country which has actually seen a cyclical melt up, uh, I think things have gone very high. Uh, now, at these high valuations, you either need the support of very large interest rate cuts or you need earnings momentum to sustain. Today, if I look at it on both the fronts, things are looking uh, dicey. Uh, first, on the earnings part, clearly this quarter has, marks a decisive shift in the earnings momentum. Uh, earnings, we have seen downgrades come through, but more importantly, profit growth is now reconciling with top line growth, and both of them are around single digits, uh, which is not very comforting you know, at these valuations. But I think the bigger, big, large inflection points historically in Indian markets have come from global events. Uh, and I think globally is where there seems to be a regime change. For the first time in four years, we are seeing markets react to growth rather than inflation concerns. Uh, this, I think, is a big shift and it will not be reversed very easily unless and until central banks go all out. Uh, there are, you know, pockets of vulnerabilities on the global front where if delays are happening and given how financialized global economy is, uh, things could worsen of sorts per se. So I think from a market standpoint, we do remain a bit more on the cautious side and we think that things are not, uh, are still very expensive and global environment and earnings environment is moving on the opposite side per se, you know. Okay. Uh, Pratik, hi. Good morning and thanks for joining us. It is an important day of trade, largely because, you know, this is the first real signs of uh, correction or pullback that this market is seeing after maybe one, one and a half years, right? Uh, so, what is the best way to approach it now? Do you raise your cash levels? Uh, do you look for opportunities to buy into large cap names? Or do you just sit back and wait for this entire thing to play out? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Sonia. Uh, and there are no easy answers for the same. <laughs> Uh, but I think if you look at it, uh, what I would do is definitely recommend uh, increased cash levels, uh, book profits in sectors where valuations are high and stocks have also run up a lot. Uh, and especially where earnings are very cyclical, you know, for example, the industrial space, real estate space, uh, autos, metals in India have seen a very strong rally. Uh, which is very idiosyncratic and disconnected from the world. So you would probably book profits there. But nonetheless, I think from a medium-term perspective, we do ha still have opportunities in large caps and especially uh, on private banks and insurance. Uh, this is a space where we strongly recommend a buy on dip kind of an approach where these are stocks or sectors which are trading close to the record low valuations. Uh, and I think earnings concerns also to a large extent are there in the price. Uh, I think this is a space where we think their absolute return can be made on a three, five year perspective. And I think that is where one should look to incrementally uh, raise allocations. But broadly, yes, raise cash levels, deploy more money in debt and book profits in cyclicals is our recommendation. Mm. You know, uh, for those of our viewers who are joining us right now, uh, the big uh, sort of headline, the news headline is at the bottom of the screen, which is that uh, the market, the Nifty is broken below. Uh, the budget day lows. I mean, uh, you know, we've all basically become accustomed to, used to the idea that whatever comes, uh, you know, the market uh, is broadly okay and drawdowns don't last at all. I mean, it's been an extremely, and I think Pratik has been pointing this out as well, it has been an extremely unusual uh, sort of market for the last uh, three, four years with not even a 5% pullback, which should be par for the course, uh, in a strong bull market even. I mean, we saw that in between 2005 and 2007. Uh, there were lots of pullbacks. 
I mean, in the next five, six years as well. But I think ever since 2000, the low of COVID, I mean, we basically had a one-way market with very, uh, very, very uh, sort of a few pullbacks along the way. Of course, I mean, late 2021, when the market topped out, uh, you know, that was the time around when some of these large IPOs were coming, like Paytm, etc. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, in the US, there was a bit of a correction. But even then, I mean, I think uh, cuts, there was, there was this sort of one phase of drawdown and nothing after that. So uh, I think uh, this is, I think, a, uh, it's been a while since uh, markets have, and that too in a synchronized way, uh, taking a bit of a knock. Uh, the big talking point, the big story, which, uh, which lies at the root of all of this, of course, is the fact that is the is 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 the US, which has been the strongest market along with India, but of course for global markets, is m so much more important. Finally, going to see, uh, you know, the so-called ha hard landing. So the consensus uh, view was that, you know, it's going to be a very nice, gentle, slowing economy, which allows the Fed to cut rates, and that's the Goldilocks. So not too uh, hard, not, uh, you know, growth still remains okay, slower. At the same time, uh, you know, it allows the Fed to gently bring down interest rates. Uh, so it's like a perfect landing, which has been thrown into question with the jobs data, which came out on Friday. Uh, I have to say, though, it is just one data point. You look at the last GDP number out of the US, which came, that was strong. Uh, you know, and, and I could point to other, other data points as well. But I think because the market in the US has been so focused on, the Fed has been so focused on la labor market, and that missed in a big way, uh, you know, people are questioning whether it's going to be, you know, that uh, very gentle, soft landing. And they've raised the odds that maybe it's going to be a little more uncontrolled, not as well orchestrated, hard landing, recession. I mean, for example, the, the other talking point in the, in, the, in the market in the U.S. is, and these are serious economists who are uh, saying whether the U.S. economy is already in a recession. And, uh, you know, one of the indicators uh, which many have been talking about is the uh, is, is uh, you know, a Fed economist uh, who, uh, who, who basically came up with this, uh, came up with this rule, uh, which essentially says that if unemployment rates, uh, sort of, you know, if unemployment in the U.S. on a six-month average basis, moving average basis, rises by more than 0.5%, uh, you know, you're basically in a recession. You, uh, it, and by the way, the unemployment rate on Friday, along with the jobs data, came very, very close to fulfilling that condition. And that's the reason why uh, it's, uh, you know, many are kind of uh, talking about whether the U.S. is already in a recession. What kind of a recession, et cetera, is another question, whether it's going to be a profits recession, which we've not had in the U.S. for a long time, uh, I think, uh, and, and which can really hurt. Remember, we had a technical recession in the U.S. The market just looked through it. This was back in 2022. Uh, but uh, we've not had a profits recession. It's too early uh, to kind of say, uh, sort of call that. The, uh, just one more point is, of course, what's happening in Nikkei. Uh, it's not so much about the Nikkei. We've spoken about, uh, you know, what's happened to the yen. The yen has gone from, is basically a rally 10%. Uh, you know, I think we were at about 160-odd levels. We are at about 140-odd levels now. This is the USD JPY. So 160 to 140 means the yen is rising, the dollar is falling. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, is, that, that is, we don't know the size of the, the so-called carry trade, but uh, because the, the, the yen rate differential and other sort of market differentials were so high, the yen was so cheap, uh, and uh, government bond deals in uh, Japan were so cheap, and everything else basically was higher or much higher, the differential was very, very high. That is not the case anymore with the Bank of Japan starting on a rate hiking cycle. And that is the reason, that's the other fact, the, uh, the other part, uh, which I think is... Uh, causing people to wonder whether Japanese investors will repatriate money back to Japan because Japanese assets are, are going to be much more attractive. But here again, the point is, will we, with, with what, what's happening in, uh, on the Nikkei, with what's happening in go government bond deals in, the, in Japan, is it a done thing that they will continue what they said they will do two weeks ago, which is you know, a rate hiking cycle? Or that is also in question. I think it's very possible that the Bank, bank of Japan finds it very difficult to actually continue to hike uh, interest rates uh, in that country uh, as it is advertised. So there are lots of moving parts. Markets are in a bit of a tizzy, a bit of a panic, uh, but uh, it's not one way, absolutely not. Both on the US front, uh, a lot of recession were thrown around. And of course, uh, in, in, with what's happened with this 10% rally in the yen and how much more can you can see. I mean, I was talking to a, a global technical analyst who was saying that 140 is the bottom. I mean, you know, it won't go, 
Uh, that's it. I mean, the market should rebound from there. So we'll see. But for now, I mean, actually, we're already at about 142.98. Uh, so uh, lots of moving parts. But for now, there is a bit of a reaction, which is not a bit of a, a fair a bit of large reaction, which is coming through uh, in, in uh, some of these markets. Pratik, uh, you know, in terms of flows and uh, the, the big thing, which is help markets, right, is uh, domestic inflows, which is sta uh, stayed rock st steady. Uh, to, uh, looking beyond today, do you think some of this will be, uh, you know, the flow, the, does, does this global narrative hurt local flows, local conviction? I mean, there's no way to tell right now, I reckon, but what's yeah. your best guess? Yeah. So again, you know, flows have been a bedrock of the bull market in India. I mean, that's why in India we have seen a very cyclical, broad-based bull market, which is not seen in any other market in the world. Uh, my only two bits on flows is that flows will eventually chase fundamentals. And if fundamentals deteriorate, whether it's because of liquidity tightening or because of earnings slowing down, flows also will reverse course. Uh, I mean, generally things don't go in a one-way street. In 2007 as well, we had very strong flows. But when the global tide turned, you know, your domestic flows also turned. So I think our only betting on flows may not be the right approach in my view. Uh, I think one should look at the fundamentals, uh, global risk appetite and the earnings, uh, all of which right now are not in the best of the position. Now, as you rightly said, does this mean that markets will go one way down? Probably not. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is still too early to call this a bottom uh, and maybe, you know, have a buy on dip kind of an approach of sorts per se, is what I would recommend. Okay. Well, uh, Pratik, thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. Just before we let you go, uh, you know, just wanted to mention that, I mean, let's not forget that if you sort of uh, look, uh, take a bird's eye view of this market in the last 15 years, and Nifty has given 12, 13% compounded growth rate, irrespective of any recession, irrespective of COVID, the pandemic, etc. Right? So, Pratik, do you think this time is going to be different? Or is that the way to approach it, that keep your shopping basket ready? Maybe not now. Uh, you know, over the next couple of months or so um, and buy every dip, is that the best way to look at it? Yeah, yeah, Sonia. I think that's, a, again, a very important question. Uh, yes, you know, markets have compounded 12-13%, you know, over the last 10-12 years and it is a recession. Uh, and this time, one thing which is, again, which is very favorable for the market perspective is the balance sheet. Uh, corporate leverage is very low, so your ability to bounce back is very high. Unlike the 2007 episode of the past crisis where we had recessions causing balance sheet scarring, which took a long time to revive, that is not the case this time around. But nonetheless, you know, as I said, in markets, there are always investing opportunities, whether in bull market or bear market. And today, you know, the main opportunity in our view lies on financial space, uh, where we think the private banks and insurance, these are the space where one should look to buy on every dip. Uh, and, you know, as and when markets valuations do cheapen out, I think there will be more opportunities in the broader market as well. But for now, I think these are the space where we would recommend buy on dip and maybe not so much uh, across the board. I mean, we need to see how situation evolves, but honestly, so on that front. Mm. But Pratik, uh, internally, you all must have discussed what's happening globally and what the screen is telling us for the last few days. Do you think this global sell-off extends itself? Just talking about the pure, pure uh, near term, what's your own guess? See, I think it's very difficult to call out the near term movements. You know, I mean, central banks have been known to be very proactive. Uh, ever since, you know, GFC of 2008, they have been very, very proactive. And I'm sure uh, that such market falls will cause, uh, will bring out a reaction from them. But I think what is fundamentally different this time is that growth, underlying growth has really slowed down. And to that extent, you know, the policy response will have to be much stronger. Uh, and do keep in mind that if you look at the global growth backdrop, it was only the US where growth was very strong. Uh, if you look at China and Europe, growth hasn't really been that great. So I think it's very difficult to call the next week what will happen or tomorrow what will happen. Uh, uh, but I think directionally, uh, if growth does cool off, I think that is a bigger concern than rather than just rate cuts coming through. Uh, I mean, rate cuts are always an help, but I think they do help only once rate cutting cycle is quite deep. In the initial stages, growth concerns uh, dominate the market narratives a lot more per se. Mm. You know, uh, just to give you an illustration of the, we were talking about the yen, right? A friend just messaged, he's also, by the way, in the markets. 
Yeah, he'd taken his son to Japan. He just returned mm -hmm. from Japan for, uh, I think he was getting a black belt. Uh, so he was, he was in Japan till last week. He said, when I left India, yen was 160. 154 when I left Japan, 148 last week and 142 wow. today. Yeah. So from one, 160, so I'm quoting with permission, I'm not, of course, uh, but 160 to 142. Uh, so that, Incredible. I think, it's just, uh, it's just a very, very large move by any yardstick, right? And uh, how many uh, sort of, you know, but just, just, uh, uh, just uh, we don't see these uh, at all. Uh, but <clears throat> Pratik, would you agree that, uh, you know, it's been a, the market went up in such a fashion, such an unusual, unusually strong fashion, nothing, uh, nothing matters. Like, I kept, I kept using the word Teflon coated because, uh, you know, bulletproof, whatever you want to call it, right? That is not uh, even very strong bull markets behave. I mean, we remember back in the day, uh, you have decent pullbacks along the way and the market keeps going higher, right? Uh, do you <laughs> think uh, th this could be uh, one of that? Or are you now starting to say that, well, maybe, you know, we are at some sort of a, a high level, peak level? Yeah. See, it's very difficult to call it, you know, ex ante, uh, where we are. But I think if you look at the earnings dynamics, and the global growth narrative, it gives me, uh, I feel I would tilt more that, you know, there could be a bit more uh, pain before eventually markets bottom up. Uh, it's difficult to call the near-term bottom and whether this pullback will be short-lived because what is different this time versus the past pullbacks, I think, is the change in global markets narrative. Until now, markets were more concerned when inflation trends used to be higher uh, and when Fed rate cuts used to be priced out. For the first time, despite increased probability of Fed rate cuts, markets are actually falling, uh, which tells you that clearly growth concerns are dominating. And if history is any guide, it, these concerns are more painful and see a bigger drawdown rather than inflation concerns where you see volatility, but that's very short term. Uh, and eventually, once things normalize, markets rebound. Like, for example, what happened in 2023? So I think to that extent, unlike uh, unlike that we have seen in the last one and a half, two years, this time around, at least there is a bit more decisive shift uh, in the overall market narrative is what I would say. Okay. Well, Pratik, it was uh, good speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And as they say, right, there's no point catching a falling knife in this market. So perhaps the best thing to do is to wait and watch. Uh, the markets generally take the stairs up and the elevator down and this is pretty much what's happening. Uh, it is turning out to be a really tough day for the market. Almost 800 points gone now on the Nifty, something we haven't seen in a long time. But we're here to give you constant updates on the market and how things are uh, going to be shaping up from here. So we'll take a quick commercial break on that note. On the other side, we'll get you more market um, veterans, market views and get you all the stocks that are in the news as well.